Yeah, we're live. And it's even before 7 o'clock. It is a whopping 6.57, so three minutes early. That's awesome. Hopefully you guys are having a good day. And today we're going to talk about oiling system modifications. And when we when we start talking about making power, and this is the way it is with anything, when you talk to somebody, hey, I, you know, I need to make more power for my combination, the first things on the list are always like, if you're talking about an NA motor, you know, it's almost always power adder stuff. But if you're talking about an NA motor, it's like heads, cam, and intake, and those sort of things that people talk about. If they're talking about the short block, they'll usually talk about compression. You know, oh, yeah, you need 10 to 1 or 11 to 1 or 12 or 15 to 1 camshafts and cylinder heads, intake manifolds, all the good stuff, because we all know that those things make power. The other thing that people will talk about, obviously, are power adders. So if we, it's easy if we add nitrous, we make a lot of power, a turbo blower, all of those things make big power gains. Um, but one of the things that people don't pay attention to, and then they really should, and, and every bit as much for the additional potential power that you can add as the additional safety that you add. And this is very important on applications where you have, where the motor is moving, <laughs> which on an engine dyno, it makes our life very easy. But even on the engine dyno, we see changes. If you're out, and this is especially true of road racing, when you're out road racing, you, um, because the oil is sloshing in the pan, and you're, you're accelerating and decelerating something you do obviously in um, in drag racing as well, but you also add lateral acceleration to that. And, it's not, and in some places, like if you're running at the banks of Daytona or some of the other tracks where you're up on the banking, um, you know, you're loading the engine for a long time. And so you have to tailor your oiling system to work under those conditions. And it's no easy feat. The nice thing is when you do tailor your oiling system to work, in that kind of environment, usually the added benefit is more power. So let's talk a little bit about what we can do to the oiling system tonight to improve the power. And you can see in the, the thumbnail for this video, there is a photo of, in this case, it's a 351 based stroker motor. I think that the one that we use is one of the ones that I did, or the one that I did for the engine masters challenge. So it was a 410 inch stroker motor because that was the limit of displacement that we could run at the time. And obviously because we're looking for every last little bit of power, you have to pay attention to the oiling system. So let's talk about different ways that you can add power to the oiling system that also help you, you know, it will help the motor survive. The one thing that we're showing or the, the two important things that we're showing in that photo is one is the oil pan itself. And if you'll notice, if you look at it very closely, that pan should have a kick out on it. If it doesn't, it, I, I may be thinking of another photo, but we did run on the oiling system that we used on the engine master's motor. Naturally, we ran a kick out pan. And what that does is it's, you know, you normally you have the edges of the pan go straight down with the, with the edge of the block. But on a kick out pan, what it's gonna do is go down and go over. And what that does is in the rotation of the crank, when that's slinging the oil, which it does, it wants to grab oil. And even it just, even just the windage in just the air and all the movement from the um, crankshaft and the rods and stuff spinning around, it wants to kind of slosh oil to one side. And so what the kick out does is allow the oil to slosh to one side and come up and hit an edge. And so it stops it from continuing to, to be involved in this, <laughs> in this power consuming process. Um, the other thing that we did on this was we had a windage tray on this. You can see in the photo there, this is a bolted, a bolt on windage tray and it has louvers in it. There, there are a lot of different windage tray designs, but again, it's kind of designed to get the windage off of the crank. You want to get that oil off. It's slinging around. It's more weight. Um, it's, it's more inertia and it, and it robs power. If you put a windage tray on an application, that's why on the LS motors, the factory LS motors have windage trays. It's one of the advantages that they have over a factory small block Chevy. Now they did have, I think that they had factory windage trays in some of the applications. They were very small ones, but uh, nobody had a full windage tray like we do on the LS. I mean, even the truck motors, which don't run a lot of RPM, have a windage tray and is definitely beneficial. So a windage tray is a good idea. Again, it helps get, get rid of some of the oil. And the other thing that helps do that, that I don't have a lot of experience with, because I don't remember, I don't remember, we were talking about putting one on the engine master's motor and that's a crank scraper. And so what it is, is like, if you think about the, the cuts in a key, they go in and, and, and 
push the little rods up and open the thing up. Um, a crank scraper does kind of the same thing. It's going to stick out from the pan. It's going to have fingers on it. And the, the, the rods or the crank journals are going to go in between these. And it's going to be very close quarters. And then as they go through it, it kind of takes the excess oil off of the crank, um, similar to what the windage tray is doing. And again, if we can get rid of that extra weight and then have that oil just go back into the pan. And then the side benefit of all of this stuff of getting this oil off and not allowing it to continue to spin around and create chaos in there is that all that does is get the oil back into the pan. That's where you want it because you want the oil and you ideally don't want aerated oil, although that's a hard thing to get away from. You want um, <laughs> nice, consistent, unaerated oil. And you want that back in the pan so that the pickup is constantly submerged and you always have like a steady supply of oil going to the pickup and then subsequently into the motor. So if you can make that happen, then obviously not only are you going to make more power, which you will with these things that we just described, you're also going to make sure, ensure that your motor always has a steady oil supply. So if you always have oil, an oil supply, you always have oil pressure, then you're not going to burn a bearing up or hurt the motor from lack of lubrication. Obviously, that's very important. And as I said, it becomes more and more important when you're slide loading the motor. What happens if you're up on a banking or you're pulling a lot of lateral Gs and you push all the oil off to one side and you uncover the, uh, uncover the pickup? That's not a good situation. So the ultimate cure for that, obviously, is a dry sump system so that it has it has a big tank that the oil pump draws from. And it's and it always the pickup basically for the pump is always submerged. It, it always has a steady supply of oil. It also has all of the things that we described. They're usually compartmentalized. It even has um, scavenge stages that help draw the oil out and away from the motor. So it really is the best thing that you can do and why most race cars have dry sump systems. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, the oil pumps themselves, the oil, and it's one of the tests that I wanted to do. And I started doing it way back when in West Tech, and we just never finished it is I want, I was going to do it on an LS. And I know the guys from West Tech have done oil pump tests where they've run standard volumes and, and high volume pumps to measure the, the power consumption and the temperature and, and the pressure, uh, with those. And they, they did a good job on that. I wanted to do it with an LS because a lot of people are concerned with, and I get this, these questions a lot. Well, do I need to run a high volume pump in, or when do I need to do that? When can, should I just run the factory pump? Should I shim the spring? When should I do all of these things? And I, I kind of wanted to look into that a little more. We've had really good luck with just running the factory pumps in a lot of things. Obviously with the big bang stuff, all of that works, but again, doing it in the you know, confines of the engine dyno where everything is kind of optimized and everything is safe. We're not moving the motor around. It's not even being um, subjected to acceleration or deceleration Gs on the engine dyno as it would in the car. So um, that sort of environment is is obviously more problematic than what we're doing on the dyno is for the oiling system and really for everything else too. Because, uh, you know, if you're running the car out on the street or at the track, you have to worry about things that we don't have to worry about on the dyno. Air filters are a perfect example of that. We ran, I run air filters when I'm, when I'm, when, if anytime I'm driving on the street or when we were running in world challenge or out of, even out at Bonneville, we always have an air filter on everything. I don't want to suck something into like at Bonneville, we don't want to suck something into the turbo. And I'm not too worried about that while we're making a run. Although the salt is fairly loose and we're pretty low and it's not uncommon for the front air dam uh, at, at speed to maybe, um, you know, to hit the salt and throw stuff up. It'd be, it's a lot more common when we're dragging the car back and we have it hooked up to the tow line and we're dragging it back to hopefully put it back into impound because we just set a record, but we have to drag it back a long ways because you have to drive it all the way back on the side of the track or on the return road. And the car that's in front throws up a ton of salt. And so you get a bunch in there. And so we don't want, we just don't want to have that possibility. And the filter helps everything. It keeps all of that stuff out. And especially if you size it big enough. And in the case of the Bonneville motor, we had it um, housed in front of the radiator, which was all fenced off so that all the air went through the radiator. In fact, we kept making the the opening to the radiator smaller and smaller because we never had a heating problem with the motor running at speed, even running at 227 miles an hour, you get a lot of airflow through the radiator. 
We even went down to the half size radiator. A lot of guys with the Hondas have the full size one. And that's what we started out with. We went down to the half size radiator because again, we just did not have a, any sort of cooling issue. And that, and that allowed us, and, and because the whole thing was fenced in, there was actually pressure on that front side. And so we had our filter with a four inch inlet tube going from the filter over into the inlet of our turbo, which was on the other side of the radiator. Actually, in this case, it was on the other side of a, um, just a cover plate that we put in place of the full width radiator. So those kinds of things are important, um, but we don't we don't normally run those on the dyno. When I run on the dyno, we very rarely do we run an air cleaner on anything because in the engine dyno, it would be very rare to have any sort of dirt and debris in there that would get into anything. Um, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. It obviously could, but it, it would be very rare, much, uh, it would be very unusual compared to the stuff, you know, driving the things out on the street or even out the track. So, and, and it's the same thing with the oiling system is if we're, the motor is basically bolted to the stand and it's not allowed to do any leaning or move around any other kind of monkey motion. So it's fairly, it's fairly easy on the oiling system. So we can run, we run a lot of stuff like junkyard motors with open pans. Like the big block stuff is a perfect example of that when we go get a gen six, four fifty four, it just has an open pan. When you take that off and look at it, you're like, man, how does this stuff like really even work? It's, it's terrible. Um, you know, we want a wind industry. We want all of those things to be there. And it's, it, it would definitely be helpful, especially if you're, as everybody is, when they're out driving around, there's movement in the vehicle. So when there's movement, the oil is going to slosh around. So, but the, and the thing I was getting to with all of this is the fuel, the oil pump itself, if you put a high volume oil pump and you're, you're just like with any compressor, if you're, whether it's a, uh, fuel pump or supercharger, if you're feeding more, processing more oil, um, and, and especially if you're doing it under higher pressure, there's going to be a horsepower penalty associated with that. We saw that when the guys, guys from West Tech did their tests on the, on the pumps, on the small blocks, but you would see that on the LS too. And, and I think that on the LS, when you're, there would be a time maybe that you would want to go to a high volume pump um, you know, like when we're running twin turbos and we're feeding the turbos, there's obviously, that's basically like an oil leak, you know, albeit a fairly small one, but because we have two of them, it's more than just a single turbo, but you will see when you run, if you run the NA motor and you monitor oil pressure, and then you put a turbo on and you monitor oil pressure, there's definitely a drop in oil pressure. So just having the turbo on there, you're going to drop oil pressure. And if you drop it too much, maybe it's a good idea to have a high volume pump on there and get the pressure back up. The other thing that, and a lot of guys rate what the oil pump is doing by pressure, and that's not really a, a super accurate way to do it because the pressure can be affected by other things. And bearing clearances are a perfect example. The bearing clearances on a factory LS are fairly tight. That's why the pressure is so high. I mean, on a cold run, you know, you can get up we've seen some of the things go over a hundred pounds depending on what viscosity oil you're using and, and how tight they were. But we, on, a, on, a, on an LS, like when we run these junkyard ones, we typically have a rising curve. Now, the more temperature we put into the oil, the, that whole curve will shift downward, but it still has a nice rising curve with RPM, which you like to see. And sometimes you don't see that with the, a, a, a more conventional oil pump, like we have in a small block Chevy or a small block Ford. So all of the things that, and all of these things help power the oil pan design, the windage tray. So a lot of pans, as a matter of fact, have integrated windage trays, which I like those. So when you bolt the oil pan in, it has basically a, a screened windage tray built into the design and, they're, and that's pretty cool. I don't think I've ever seen one that also has a, uh, a crank scraper because the crank scraper is going to be so close that it almost has to be pinned in place because the closer that you get it, the more, sh more shearing you're going to get. And you obviously don't want it too close. And when you put an oil pan on, if you've ever put an oil pan on, you know that there's a, you know, there's a little bit of slop there. And a lot of times the crank scraper won't, won't accept that kind of slop. So pan, uh, oil pump, windage tray, dry sump, obviously would kind of be the ultimate thing. The viscosity, the oil has an effect too. A lot of newer cars are going to very lightweight oils. Some of them are even going to zero weight. If you look back at the older stuff, it's it's usually at least 1030, but it can be 1040 or 1050. And, and some guys, you know, if you have a motor that 
<laughs> that has low, low oil pressure. Some of the ways that they cure that is, hey, let's just put straight 50 weight in there and we'll get our oil pressure up. <clears throat> yeah, you can do that. But is the oil pressure really the answer? Is that the thing? Because if you look at cup motors, they uh, uh, the race motors that they use in cup, they they don't run a lot of oil pressure. As a matter of fact, they want to minimize that. So they want to have the they have the right amount of oil flow, but they also want to negate the power loss associated with getting that oil flow. So they do a real balancing act, making sure because obviously if these motors are running for 500 miles at the kind of RPM that they're running at, they have to have lubrication and they have to have the right you know protection for the bearings. So they don't go, okay, well, we'll, we'll do that with, you know, 80 or 90 pounds of pressure. Well, that they can do that, but they know that it costs them power. So they do just the amount that they need and they have the best combination. This is how in depth they look at these kinds of things. They have the best combination of power, not power loss <laughs> of power consumption versus protection from their oiling system. And it's really pretty cool. That's, uh, that's the reason that I like reading up on a lot of these things to see what level they take these things to. So if you apply that same thing to valve spring load or camshaft uh, surface finish and, and really everything, because at the highest levels of racing, they absolutely have to look at everything, which is why you might want to have gun drilled camshafts that are crankshafts, you know, all of this stuff they have to consider to make it as effective as possible and not leave any power on the table because there's another guy over down the road at another shop that's trying to make a little bit more power than you. And if you leave that on the table, obviously he's going to figure it out and take advantage of it. And then the next race comes and he has three or four more horsepower, or whatever, there's a good chance he could do a lot better than you. So that is my discussion on oiling systems. And I, as I said, I did, you, I, we employed a lot of these things when we were looking at the, I, and by the way, in my engine master's motor, I used a standard volume oil pump. I didn't even use a high volume one. We used a windage tray. I used a good oil pan. And uh, the other thing that I did in this and that a lot of guys did, they wouldn't let us do it externally, which is what I wanted to do. But the other thing to consider is drain back. So all the oil that you pump up, and this becomes super critical when a guy is putting a you know, he has a five quart pan and he decides in a small block Ford or small block Chevy and he decides to put a high volume oil pump because we've all been taught through years of reading all the magazines and stuff that you have to run a high volume oil pump. High volume oil pump is the equivalent of having like more compression. <laughs> more is better. So high, vo high volume oil pump is better than a standard volume oil pump. Nobody uses that. I, I got high volume oil pump. Yeah, that's awesome. You may or may not want that, especially if you have, if you have a five quart pan and you're running the motor wide open throttle for any length of time, you're going to pump all the oil up to the top of the motor. And if you don't have good drain back, it's going to stay up there. And if you have all the oil at the top of the motor, the valve springs will be nice. They'll stay nice and cool. The valve, the valve covers will be full of oil. But what will happen to the bottom part of the motor? Well, you have no more oil for the oil feed. And then pretty soon you're going to burn something up because you, you have lack of oil. So the other thing that happens is um, oil drain back. So you want to make sure, and that's why guys go to a lot of trouble. And if you look at any form of racing, they all do this. Look at how they massage the oil drain backs to take off the sharp edges, maybe make the drain backs bigger. The other thing that, that you can do, and we did some of this stuff in engine masters is you want to channel where the oil goes. Like I said, I, I ideally I'd like it to go out of the valve cover and down outside the block and then go back into the pan because what you don't want it to do is you know you're going through all this trouble with crank scrapers and windage trays and pan design to keep the oil off the crank well if all the oil is going to the top of the motor and you let it just drain down onto the top of the camshaft and or the crankshaft you're just adding all the windage back to it and so that's why if you can design your drain back system to go to the sides of the crank ideally through channels in the block that don't allow it to come anywhere near the crank, but still allow it unrestricted flow back down into the pan to make sure that we have, you know, it fills up the sump so that the, so that the pickup never becomes um, uncovered. So that there's a constant supply of oil. If you can do that, you'll pick up even more power get all of that oil away from the crank. The only oil you want touching the crank are the ones where there, <laughs> where there are bearings there. So that's another important one. Oil drain back is very important. And like I said, that's why scavenge stages for dry sumps work so well. They get all of that oil out and they make sure that there's always a good supply and that a lot of that stuff is not coming back down and 
creating more windage problems. So let's see what you guys have going on. That's my discussion on oiling systems. Then obviously there's more stuff to discuss there, but those are all things that I'm fairly familiar with. A lot of things that we've done in the past on some of our motors. Um, a lot of stuff on junkyard motors, we don't do that. Although I said the, the pump situation and windage tray, and even to some extent, the oil pan, although a truck oil pan is fairly standard, but at least it has a windage tray. And so that helps, um, that helps obviously with, uh, helps reduce windage and helps, um, helps add more power. I, I, and I, you know, the thing I've never done now that I think about it that I'd like to do is I'd like to run a windage tray, no windage tray on the LS and find out um, how much power that's worth. And again, the problem is running it on an engine dyno. It doesn't always tell you what's happening in the real world because we don't have oil sloshing around and with oil sloshing around, it would be much worse. Uh, can you do a test of slick, slick 50 versus air lubrication? Air lubrication could actually work. I remember somebody telling me, this is one of the things that um, Chad and I were going to do on my Wheel of Death show. We wanted to run water. So we wanted to just fill the pan full of water and see how long the motor would run just on water. And I think it would last fairly long, given the fact that, especially if we ran it beforehand with oil, because we know that when we drain all the oil out of it at wide open throttle, the motor lasted like a minute and a half. And, and and we were still seeing some oil pressure there just from the, the gears. They didn't have any more oil in the pan. It was all drained out. But just the oil, the, the remaining oil that was in the gears made those pumps still work fairly well. And so I think what we were seeing was just oil pressure in the system, which is kind of awesome. But I think with water, it might work for you know fairly well maybe that would be a good video to see if the how long the thing would run on water uh racer d that's right some engines have new variable variable displacement oil pumps Yeah, Evan said he saw a video where a guy talked about lack of oil pressure of the bearings due to twin turbo LS. Like I said, it, it definitely takes oil flow away. How much is a different thing? Oh, yeah, John, I forgot, and I should have mentioned that because we'd actually use those on our road race cars. Uh, he's talking about an AccuSump, which basically is a big pressurized cylinder. So what it does is when you start your motor, you it, it fills the cylinder up with oil under pressure. And then what happens is if you're, and we use it because we had to run the bankings at like Phoenix and stuff. And when, when you're out running on the banking, it's, there's a good chance that you can get oil starvation. If you get oil starvation and the pressure in the system goes down below what it is in the AccuSump, the AccuSump plunger basically pushes the oil out of that and then provides you with oil pressure back to your system, at least for as much as that AccuSump will fill, will hold. And there, there are different size AccuSumps, I think. So you can you can save yourself a motor by doing that. Um, the problem is that it's not going to, you, you can't run around like an hour like that with, with the AccuSump, unless you come down off the banking and it stabilizes and fills back up. And if you if you planned all of that correctly, you could work it for, it would work fairly well. But um, I have used AccuSumps in the past and they do work. 10 PSI per thousand, not to wreck your car. That's an old wives tale. If you take a look at the cup guys, they don't, they don't run anywhere near that. Super stock and stock limiter guys use low volume oil pumps. Yep, just they're just trying to make the power. They know that it doesn't take that much oil flow or pressure to keep their stuff safe. And if you can, but again, <laughs> it's a juggling act. You keep taking that away to the point where, oh, okay, now I have oil starvation. And so it's we, not, we need to not go that far. We need to not go down to five PSI. Uh, we need to go somewhere up from there, but not at 100. Yeah, you can get your, they're talking, Tim and Shadow Ops are talking about the crank scraper stuff. You can get it too close and, and you know, some guys will, <laughs> As long as it doesn't grab it and, and bend it down or grab it and pull it up, um, it will run with it hitting. 
Uh, and as long as it like for the problem is you don't want the friction from that happening, but if it's just hitting a tiny bit, <laughs> that might be okay. Yeah, come on guys, get those likes up. Yeah, that's a night. Uh, Mike mentioned that there's a uh, um, getting a oiling system right there. Uh, David's book, Visard's book on big block Chevys, that there's a lot of information in there. A lot of that stuff is universal. The the pump and the pan and wind train, all that stuff translates right to almost any of these like wet sump kind of motors. I was thinking in 50,000 miles, I'd drop a high volume pump on my LR4 block. I'm at 150. Well, as long as you, as long as it continues to have good oil pressure, I have a full-on Canton nine-quart road race pan in my Gen One small block. Runs a cooler, oil pressure is steadier with it. Three trap doors, crank scraper, light. And that's good. That's good stuff. And that's the other thing to think about is you can add volume by having uh, either a remote filter and or an oil cooler, which an oil cooler is a good idea, especially if you're out on the track circulating, running road racing. We had those on ours, and I had one on my. Mustang when I was running a Silver State too. Smoke Unix had run a stock pump and two and a half thousands clearance on the Chevy. Why, why pump oil at the sides of the bearings with big pumps and clearances? Unless the cranker rods are bending, it makes no sense. My 544V takes quite a while to get oil pressure of a milling standard volume pump and had a Vortec. The Vortec is the same way unless it's a unless it's one of their um, self-contained units. If it's one that requires oil feed, um, then that will do the same thing as a turbo. And the Vortec may, I'm thinking that the orifice on the Vortec might be bigger than what we run on most of the turbo stuff. Ever played with a Spintron machine? I haven't run one. I've been back when the guys uh, at Brian Tooley Racing were running theirs, and also the guys at Skunk were doing a bunch of stuff when I ran the K Series Honda. They're pretty cool, and I, and I really like the information. Brian and I talk about that all the time um, about valve balance and, and lots of things that contribute to valve train instability. And there's a lot. There's lots of information there. So the Harley Davidson twin cam 88 had problems with heads getting hot and bringing oil on the top of the heads. They increased oil to the top of the heads to improve, to move heat away from the heads. That's true. They can use that for cooling, especially on a, on an, is that an air cooled deal? And, and it would be, especially on an air cooled deal. If it's water cooled, if the heads are water cooled, that, that goes a long way toward helping with the cooling issue. But on air cooled stuff like VW stuff and Porsche stuff, um, oil takes away a lot of the heat as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is the other thing that can reduce oil pressure, and we talked about that a little bit, are piston squirters. Now, Honda has been using, had been using piston squirters like on their B-Series stuff for a really long time, and they work very well. Lots of guys are using it now, but squirting oil from the rods, the bottom side of the piston, helps with piston temperature, especially for sustained running. And I think that's one of, one of the reasons that those motors tended to last so long. Would you say that the oiling system on a small block Chevy is better than an LS oiling system? Uh, yes and no. I like the pump a lot better on an LS, but I'm told that the oiling system and and it's more the um, it's more the design of the bottom half of the LS motor. Uh, if you look at the changes that they made from a Gen three to a Gen four, they put a big communication tunnel in there because they had individual, you basically had indi individual chambers and that's not ideal for um, oiling. So they wanted them all to communicate something that the small block Chevy does much better because it's not, because the block doesn't, you know, it's, it's not a skirted block, doesn't come all the way down past the crankshaft. <laughs> Running on Mountain Dew. I guess that would be even better if I ran it on something funny, huh? Rather than just water. 
Maybe, um, maybe Perrier. Garage 54 used Don dish detergent. Okay. Let's say you have a great oiling system. Is there a huge advantage to having the crank knife edged and having it micro polished or micro blued with ceramic coated bearings? Um, I don't know about the ceramic coated bearings. I, I think that that's going to be a longevity thing. Um, micro polishing the crank or even knife edging it, the gains from that are going to be less the better your oiling system is um, because the knife edging is obviously getting rid of the windage, although it's also cutting it through the air and there's always going to be oil mist and stuff going on in there. So maybe the knife edging would help that. Also the knife edging is probably taking weight away from the crankshaft, which again, probably helps. My complimentary 305 Chevy ran 10,000 RPM with 40 pounds of oil pressure. See, there goes the thousand, <laughs> the 10 PSI per thousand RPM thing, right? Yes, reversing pistons. That's 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 a must. Eighteen hundred horsepower mountain motor run 40 to 60 PSI of oil pressure at 8,300 RPM. Does polishing oil galleys help cooling? No, probably not. But what it does is help, it helps drain back. And it, oh, are you talking about the oil galleries on the feed side? Um, that might help a little bit. It's certainly going to help oil flow. But I would be interested to see if it actually has a, um, a change in oil temperature from, I know that the guys from Extrude Hone have done a lot with blocks where they extrude home the oil passages. And they're, what they're doing is getting, if you could see it here, they're getting away from the, they're smoothing the rough edges that on intersecting. Because when you're making oil passages, they could be either cast or drilled. And, and no matter what happens, they're going to they're gonna have some edge. And if you can round that edge off, things will be better and it will flow better. I, I honestly don't know what that would do to, I don't know if we would actually be able to measure the change in temperature. Maybe you would. One, one area that they did do on the oiling system is the, the, a lot of the racing connecting rods had an EDM oil hole um, like they used to, to squirt the piston and stuff. So they'd EDM the oil hole, but the EDMing process would leave like casting flash. And so when they'd run and it wouldn't, and it wouldn't come off right away. And so, but when they would run these motors and they would get the right frequency and the right temperature and the right amount of oil flow through it, some of the casting flash would come off and then the, they would do, lose a rod or lose a bearing. And so by extrude honing it, they get rid of that casting flash on a lot of these race car motors. It was, it was really cool stuff. Yeah, Racer D, it would be interesting to actually measure the pressure at the bearing. Since it's all just, if you've ever watched, if you ever spun an oil pump, and, and had the motor upside down and spun an oil pump and watch what's happening at the lifter, at the camshaft or at the crankshaft and see the oil just blowing out of the, the mains or, or the, um, and the rods, uh, there can't be very much pressure there. There's no Nova update since, <laughs> since last night. Uh, Richard, did you run a thermostat on the oil cooler? I did not. Uh, the one that I ran in at the Silver State was not actually really big. Uh, it was probably about this big. And I wanted to run it more because we were running wide open throttle and I was running the Vortex. So we wanted to have the oil cooler there because I thought that the Vortex might add some oil temperature and, and running sustained like that. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had a you know, cooler oil temperature. Yeah, Jonathan's saying polishing would decrease flow, but rough surfaces has a higher contact area. But I don't think you're looking at um, absorbing oil temperature from the pressure side because the flow, again, just like the airflow into the motor, the flow of the, the oiling system through the passage probably is such that it's not, I don't think you're getting a lot of um, heat absorption there. Maybe you are.
uh, Paul wants me to talk about crankshaft, how it pumps oil have, by having it spin. And because it's constantly spinning, even if it doesn't actually touch the oil, which on an LS, it obviously doesn't, but you still see this maelstrom going on the inside there. What I want to do, and I really need to do this, is I need to make the clear oil pan so we can kind of see that. And I'd like to do a side, you know, we'll make a big box pan and I'll do a side and either a front or a back so we can look in there, hopefully, and get an idea. There's going to be so much oil slinging around that I'm hoping that, um, I can make it so we can actually see stuff and maybe a strobe light in there too will be cool. Can you convert a stock small block to priority main oiling? Do some of the, it, some of the um, aftermarket blocks may, might have that. I'm getting impatient waiting for parts for my Turbo 3800 build. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm, I'm getting impatient waiting for mine to just even start. Whatever happened to the idea of an oil pump for pre-start? Um, that's a good idea. And we do that on a brand new motor when we put a motor on the dyno, if it's not a junkyard motor that already has a bajillion miles on it. If it's a brand new motor that we just put together and it's fresh, we will always prime it. So we'll we don't have the distributor in there. We use a drill. We use a, you know, usually a distributor shaft or something, drive the oil pump. We'll, we make sure that we have the valve covers off. We make sure that the, there's oil to every rocker. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we spin the motor over by hand and just make sure that there's oil everywhere before we start it. And then once we start it and you do that also just in case it doesn't start for whatever reason, maybe you have the timing off, maybe, you know, maybe something's wrong with the ignition system, whatever the problem is, and it doesn't start, you don't want to be cranking it there and have everything be dry. And, and also this tells you that the oil pump is working, it's picking up, there's oil everywhere. And then when you go to start it, you have immediate oil pressure and it's much better. Uh, Mark's still working on drain back on the 4200. Uh, Turbo Tony putting an LS in my jet boat will be turning 4,500 to 5,000 all day. I'm running a Corvette eight quart pan and a Mellings high volume oil pump. We'll have a problem oil starvation. Um, I don't think so with that big of a pan. Speed TV pulls the heads for a cam swap on LS. <laughs> Maybe they're just worried about the lifter dropping. 91 5th gen 454 and RV 50 PSI is fine. Uh, S4 just joined. Might have covered this overfilling. I overfill the LQ4 based on all my experience with the road racing. It's dangerous in high G situations due to oil not returning to the pan. If you see that that works, that's fine. I don't like overfilling because it definitely has a detrimental effect on power. It also increases windage when you do that. So those two things are bad. But obviously, if you have oil starvation and you've cured that, that's good. Yeah, we don't want, yeah, the, I, I was just kidding about the Mountain Dew thing. I just think something something would be cool just because it's funny, but the um, you're right, the sugar would <laughs> turn into sandpaper. That would not be good. How important is the oil diverter barbell upgrade? I'm not familiar with the upgrade. What what do people do? We we just put the factory plastic one in there. Yeah, but Tom, if you're not a captain, but do you have the leg up captain stance though? It's just a stronger barbell. I don't think you have to worry about that. Uh, Evan, the Glipdol stuff works good. Lot, lots and lots of racers use that and, and not drag racers probably do, but definitely road racers and a lot of roundy round guys use that. And they, they epoxy in screens and stuff in case they use, in case they lose, um, you know, lifters or, or rockers. <laughs> EDM has a different meaning.
Yeah, Tim, it does the it does send it across the distributor because if the distributor's not in, you won't get oil pressure. We've found that out a few times. <laughs> and also if we don't have our we have a an oil priming set up and we've tried a couple of different ones, a couple of inexpensive ones from China, and you put it in there and it'll spin the shaft, you know, either a small block Chevy or a small block Ford. But if it doesn't have a slot in the right spot, then the oil just comes all out over where the distributor is and doesn't go through the lifter galleys. Will I have any oil problems running stock oil pump with a, with a truck pan in a quarter mile off? I have a lot of front suspension travel. Is the, I, I can't remember, is the truck a rear sump? Isn't it, isn't it a rear sump? Arturo just got here. What's your opinion on cross-drilled main crankshafts? I, I, we see it on a lot of applications. Um, I, I worry about putting holes in the crank as, as a starting point for cracks, but... If you chamfer them and do that, I, I think that that's probably fine. And it probably helps if they're, a, a lot of guys like that on camshafts too. They want to have oiling on both sides or, or sometimes a slot in the, in the um, cam journal. I do oil systems for large centrifugal turbines. Windage can be seriously impactful to horsepower. We, we've we seen it a lot. And you know where we see it more than anywhere else is on a big block Chevy. If you have a big block Chevy and you overfill the pan, and by the way, when somebody, if you buy a pan from all of these aftermarket pan manufacturers and they tell you that it's a seven quart pan, we never run that much oil in these pans. And obviously we're running them stationary. But even for a dyno sweep, if we put that much oil in it, it will have a ton of windage and the oil pressure curve will be terrible. It won't be better. It will be worse. And then when we start taking oil uh, level away, we start draining oil out of it. The oil pressure curve gets better and better. And so does the power. And I do, I do have one overfilling um, story for you guys. <laughs> we bought uh, one of the, I, it, it's probably a JDM motor back in the day, but it was a little Honda. We were, my buddy Harold and I were, uh, he was putting another motor in one of his Hondas. And so we, uh, we, we did the brick on the pedal thing and blew their other motor up because it was already smoking. I mean, it would smoke so bad that we would pull up to a light and smoke was just pouring out of the vents and the hood and stuff. And people were like looking at us. Like, that thing's definitely going to blow up. But it got really bad. But we eventually put a brick on it and revved it up and let it free rev as, as much as it would. And, we, and it took three or four times before it finally broke. But it finally broke. We put another motor in. And so we were getting everything ready. You know, we're, we're this, making sure the distributor's in the right spot, make sure all the plugs are in there. And we put, um, filled the thing up with oil and uh, went to start it. And... <laughs> <laughs> oil started coming out everywhere because it was already full of oil. So we had 10 quarts of oil in our, in our Honda. And you know, when you take the cap off the valve cover, or whatever, <laughs> you could see oil all the way up the top. It was a lot. So I'm certain that one had windage. Is there any difference keeping oil temperature low, like 140 or lower compared to 180? there's going to be a difference in power. Ideally for power for us, when we're on the engine dyno, low water temperature and high oil pressure. And I don't mean high, I just mean 180 or 200 degrees. When setting preload on anti-pump uplifters, I is it what application is it? Is it a small block Chevy? Is it an LS? And I don't I don't know what the term anti-pump uplifter is. Is it a short travel lifter? Uh, 
Admiral, that's a good idea. It's Camaros. It's better to have two of them. Yep, loud and proud. If you can create a vacuum in there, you can make more power. That's how vacuum pumps work. Is but then vacuum pumps become more or less effective depending on your ring package. And it's the same thing with a um, with a dry sump setup. If you could, you're pulling vacuum in that, it works like a vacuum pump, and you can improve power just by doing that. Yeah, too much oil can definitely cause problems. You see LS motors spinning cam bearings? I, I've only ever had that happen one time, and it's on a motor that we were not nice to, and it came from the wrecking yard, so I had no idea if it was bad beforehand or if it had 100, 200, 300, or 400,000 miles on it. But I, I haven't seen that happen in our motors. What's the highest percentage of water alcohol that you can use alone in an engine? Are you trying to run that as the primary fuel or are you doing a water meth injection? Uh, we talked a little bit about dry sumps. Have you ever tested that old graphite? Old Arco graphite, man, that was the stuff. I used to put that in my Camaro. You put it in and, and after running the motor for five minutes, the oil would look like it needed an oil change because it was really dark going in. I think that they just used, <laughs> I think Arco Graphite was just used oil that they sold us. Yeah, I don't see uh, if you do the problem with an LS spinning a cam bearing, and it was this this way for a long time, and I haven't checked to see if somebody has rectified this. If it does spin a cam bearing, you usually just throw away the block because nobody had an oversized cam bearing. If the oil pan screen is too fine for a 5W30 synthetic versus a 1040 or a 2050, could be slowing your oil flow down. It would be very rare that the screen is so fine that it wouldn't work with um, a certain viscosity of oil. They're usually not that fine. Do you have any experience with needle bearings and a solid roller lifter? I actually don't like solid roller lifters um, in street applications. Brule loves them to run on the dyno, like especially in big block applications, because that's kind of his deal. But I think they're a terrible choice for a, a street motor. One, I don't like having to constant, I know, and I know back in the day that this was a big thing, that I don't like constantly having to, to adjust the lash on it. And I also don't think that the... Um, solid roller stuff lasts the way that a hydraulic roller does. S4 Meow, oh, so this was a coyote problem that you were talking about? Uh, Tom seems like maybe he's been hitting the sauce a little bit tonight. <laughs> I don't know about which one makes the loudest noise. Steve Morris typically runs a hundred pounds of oil pressure.
To properly conduct oil pressure, you need to drive the engine with no spark plugs with an electric motor and a stepper gearbox up to the maximum designed RPM and check what's happening in the oil. Why Why would we need to do that? Why couldn't we just do it, well, with the motor running the way that it is when, when it's running? <laughs> An anti pump up lifter. So don't you don't you wouldn't you want the lifter to pump up? Isn't that its design? Isn't that a design criteria for a lifter? I've drained five gallons of oil from Dermax with a leak injector. That sometimes happens. That that's a bad situation when you go to to drain or check or change the oil, and um, a whole bunch of water comes out. That's never a good sign. Big block Chevy's lifters are supposed to have less travel than regular hydraulic lifters. Might have another name. Um, okay, that's probably just a short travel lifter. And so what you have is you have a limited amount of range. A lot of times hydraulic lifters, whether they're hydraulic roller or hydraulic flat tappet, have basically a lot of movement in them. So a short travel lifter doesn't. It has very little. So you have to be ultra critical about what size push rod you um, use with that. And you know you have to set the geometry up. It's a lot less forgiving but it's supposed to run better though. Had Arco Graphite in my Vega, nice. I know, I didn't ever have any problems with my Camaro, but I can't imagine that it's that it was great though. Any experience with the roller cam bearings in a racing application? I've never run those. Uh, I've seen a couple of motors at West Tech where they did, but I've never done it. Uh, what does Brulé think about the 4200 testing? I, I'm not even sure he, he even saw it or acknowledged it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a big block. I don't think that he's too interested. What do you think about the Phytech harness? I don't, I've never used it, so I can't really comment on that. Come on, let's, let's, come on, throw them at me, throw them at me. Bring me those questions. <laughs> Brule is big block Chevy centric. Brule is great. He's awesome. Um, and he's the guy that I go to whenever I have questions about stuff. Um, not, not obviously like late model turbo stuff, but if I have, you know, cause he's done so much testing. That's all that he does every day is, is dyno testing and he's really good and he has a he has a, a lot of background that i don't have so he's worked at machine shops and he's done lots of stuff that um a lot of people don't even know about and so he's a he's a good guy to like bounce stuff off of and he's enthusiastic he likes he likes his stuff i mean he likes big blocks more than anything but he he likes all of the stuff and he was really excited um he didn't think he was going to be but he really liked when they ran the late model hemi there with the variable intake and then the, the variable cam and you know it, it gets a little frustrating having it not work and when you're hooking it up and having it not start and run to be able to tune it but once they get past that he was like man this thing makes really good power it's you know if you can get them like you know tuning the thing and and it's all cooperating it works out great gen 5 lt4 are the gm ls7 lifters good for 6500 to 7000 rpm i i don't know why they wouldn't be since they run that far on a ls7 and we run 7000 rpm on truck lifters and on 
on Felpro lifters and stuff. So I don't know why they wouldn't be. The power gain, <coughs> excuse me. The power gains from solid lifters aren't worth the Valtteri nose. I agree. I'm not a fan of solid lifters. Like I, I probably will never run another set on, on an LS. I know that guys do it. I know the the drag race guys, and they like to run RPM. And if you're trying to make a million horsepower at nine thousand RPM, it's probably a good way to go. It just takes so much to do that. Oh, there's Tim chiming in on the stock L5P Duramax lifters and stock LS lifter trays. <laughs> Wouldn't high horsepower applications require more oil pressure? Uh, no, they won't. Look at, like I said, look at cup stuff. Look at some of the drag race stuff. Those are certainly high horsepower things. To prevent metal contact between the crank and the bearing, they're already doing that, but they're trying to do it with as little oil flow and pressure as you can. There's a there's too much, and then there's not enough, and then there's just the right amount that does everything that you need it to do, and, and including one of those design criteria is that it doesn't cost a lot of power. Because if you have too much, anything that's too much, anything that goes beyond what is necessary is just costing you power. What kind of oil should we run for break in and how long should we break it in? When I, it, and most of that depends on the motor, like breaking in a motor, an, an LS, for instance, that has a hydraulic roller cam. Um, the hydraulic roller cam, you, you don't need to really break that in. It's, we put new ones in and we just run it right away. The thing that's going to break in is you'd like to give the rings time to seat on the, in the bores. Um, the bearings are not going to break in. If you, if we, pre-lube everything so that we make sure that we have oil to it when you start it up. Um, the only thing really that's going to break in in, a, in an LS, in my opinion, is the rings and they're going to seat. And so we run them normally 15 minute, 10 or 15 minute cycles. And what the, what the break-in cycle does on the LS or on, on any motor that we run on the engine dyno, it just varies the load and varies the RPM and it just runs through a break-in cycle. And we normally do two of them, and then, it, then it's kind of ready to go. It will break in a little bit more as we run it. Um, and a lot of guys say, no, you got to break it in hard. We got to break it in at wide open throttle because then it knows it wants to run at wide open throttle and it'll make more power. All, all of that stuff is fine, but the way <laughs> this is the way that we do it. We break it in easy. And, and more to, so that we know that everything is okay. While, you know, when you start it up and, okay, yeah, it takes throttle, nothing's kicking out the side, everything seems like it's okay. Um, on a flat tappet cam application, like a small block shavier, small block forward, small block dodge, the break-in procedure is much more critical. And, and we do it differently a lot of times, especially now, Brulee's told me that a lot of the flat tappet stuff is having trouble again with cams and lifters going bad. So the way that I was doing it before when we had all this trouble is I would use um, Molly assembly lube on all of the cam lobes and the bottoms of all the lifters. I would put high zinc oil and an additive, <laughs> more zinc, as an additive. And then we would take, if it was a dual spring, a lot of times you don't have a lot of spring pressure on a hydraulic flat tap at camshaft, especially if it's a low RPM deal. But if we have a dual spring, a lot of times we'll take out the inner spring and just run it with an outer and break it in again at low RPM where we cycle it from like 2,500 to 32 or 3,300. And what we're looking for is the, on, on the, when we're breaking in the load on the, hydraulic flat tap at camshaft, we're looking for a change in torque reading because the cycle is doing the same thing every time. So it will go up to a certain load and a certain RPM. And we know that, okay, that's, let's say that that's 76 foot pounds. And then it'll go down to another and we'll say, okay, that's 51 foot pounds. And then as it, as it goes through the cycle, you'll actually see those numbers start to increase because it will start making more power at, at this, at these same points. And if we see that, it's okay. If we see it going down and we see oil pressure coming down or anything else, then we know that there's a problem. And that's something that we look for during the break-in cycle. We'll also go out and check and make sure that, like, Brulee likes to go out and they do this on solid flat tap and stuff too. They'll go out and check the lash again just to make sure that 
is anything going away? Is if the camshaft is going away and you set the lash at 18 thousandths and now it has 47 thousandths lash, you're like, oh, hang on. We, <laughs> we need to look at something. Did the poly lock back off? Or more likely, did, did we damage a rocker? Did we damage a push rod? Or is the cam going flat? And we would take that stuff out. We would look down in there, maybe take the intake off and go, hey, look, we have a problem. Check the oil filter, see if there's material in there. And it can help you solve problems, little problems. And that's a fairly good size problem, but, but it didn't take the whole motor out. So we can solve little problems like that by going through this process and then see what's going on. Then once everything is okay, we do, you know, do the spring swap, put the other springs in and rev it up and... Hopefully everything is okay. Yeah, Procharge Mopar, you're right. If you if you if you run 100 psi of oil pressure and you're making 2,500 horsepower and that's what it requires to to do that, then you should do that. <laughs> Flex all brakes in his engines at 15,000 RPM. That's what the idle speed is set at. Is an upgrade oil pump needed for a Gen 5 LT4? I don't think so. I think that that's a, a two-stage pump already. Uh, Richard, would you suggest running a high volume oil pump on a 302 small block floor with a high capacity oil pan? N not necessarily. It depends on what the power output is, the RPM and what your bearing clearances are. And does it have forced induction on it? We have, um, Evan, we have oil additives that we use that are high zinc stuff. The Lucas guys have a bunch of stuff. We have oil that's high zinc, break in, it's break in specific oil. And then we have additive packages on top of that. And then, like I said, I put um, Molly assembly lube on the bottom of the lifter and on the, um, and on the cam lobe. And then before we start it, we prime everything with the oiling system and then start it and run it. If you had an oil pan with windows, wouldn't you need to run the engine for longer than your typical dyno pull to see how the, well, but we could, we can load the engine or even just free rev the engine at 5,000 RPM and, and with a strobe and, and film that we could film a run during a dyno pull. You'll, we could see it. We're not trying to find out if there's, um, if we're sucking the pan dry or anything, we just want to see what kind of chaos is created in there in the oil pan. Uh, Daniel's talking about, um, galley restrictors and, and that's not unusual that, that people run oil restrictors for different kinds of applications. Cause you're, you're, what you're trying to do is get more oiling to one part of the motor and less to another. If you're over oiling one part of it, there's no reason to have the oil there, especially if it's at the expense of somewhere else. If you're pumping all the oil to the top, you can run restrictors to pump less oil up top, keep it more down. So it's oiling the cam or the mains. Rob Doms is building a six rotor rotary engine. Well, sure. Why wouldn't you? Because four is not nearly enough. <laughs> Three or four isn't enough. You need to preheat the oil for cam break in because the additive package is activated with heat.
Uh, Mike, your Mike is saying as 355 small block Chevy oil pressure drops during a quarter mile pass. Does it drop at the top? Does it drop after you lift it off? When is it dropping? That will give us a better idea on what you're talking about. If it's just during acceleration, you're probably pumping all the oil to the top. If it's after you lift off, it may be it may be oil slosh under diesel. Just bought a six liter and pulled a band down two pistons no longer holding on. That's not good. I think they're supposed to be connected, aren't they? So it's not really a six liter. Now it's only a four or five liter, right? Um, preheating the oil. I haven't heard that before break-ins because we're breaking in a motor that's, you know, usually these are kind of street motors. Um, definitely preheating uh, oil is an important thing for a lot of race motors. A lot of guys do that at Bonneville. Lots of guys done that in road racing. I know my buddy Bernie, they had an Aston Martin that that was part of the starter procedures. You, the oil has to be at a certain temperature before you can start the car. Obviously, that's a pain, but it's that's what the that's what the oil, the oiling system and the bearing clearances and everything in the motor were designed to do. They were designed to run at that temperature. So it cannot be started <laughs> until it's at that temperature. So you circulate the oil through a heater until it's at the right temperature. And then when it goes through the motor. And again, like I said, there are guys out at Bonneville that do the same thing. They want to, because they don't start their cars and run them because a lot of them are cantankerous and stuff. And so they want to make sure that, because you don't, the other thing you don't want to do is start up a like ice cold motor, start it up and just roar out and go, go at wide open throttle and, and try to go as fast as you can. That's also not good for the motor which is why like, which is what, what was so nice about the Honda Civic that I ran is we could just sit there and idle it. It didn't care. It was like, it was like almost like a stock B series. Uh, Sir Johnson, that's the wrong spelling for the name. So I'm not related to those guys. Better question. You ran 155 proof moonshine as an only fuel source. How low can you go? Um, th that stuff was already fairly low. Um, it didn't make a lot of power. It, it would probably burn lower than that. Um, but we're, you know, you're, you're getting to a point where you're going to start you have to run a lot of fuel through it, which we had to run a ton more of that moonshine through it than we ran the E85. So, you know, I, you could do it as a gee whiz thing, but it's not really going to benefit anybody. Yep, Tom has been put in timeout. Yeah, the glip ball on the lifter valley works good. Advice roller tip versus full roller rockers. Um, the full roller rocker for a small block Chevy, Ford, or Dodge works a lot better. <clears throat> the fulcrum probably is where most of the gain comes from, not the tip. Um, so I know that Comp made just, just the roller tip versions with the, the regular pivot, but uh, I like full rollers on that stuff and they're not, they're not terribly expensive. Yeah. Formula one brings the whole engines to temperature.
What kind of horsepower increases are evident from an inch and seven eighths to two inch header? Sometimes none. Sometimes you can lose a little bit of power. It just depends on the application. Probably a fair bit on a big block Chevy, <clears throat> less on an LS and, and maybe none. Uh, we don't run Glyptol for street motors. How much do oil systems add on LS? They add less than on a small block because they're already fairly good. They already have a windage tray. You could put a better pan on it, um, but it, it already has a windage tray, and that's the biggest thing. My friends used to think they needed hooker super comp headers. Uh, we put hooker headers on a lot of stuff, but headers are a good idea. But the, the good ones were like the um, 3995, complete with the nuts, bolts, and gaskets from super shops. And I think that those were headmans. You can change the size of the oil gallery holes. But is the problem that you're not getting enough flow to it? Or is it a pressure or volume thing? <laughs> yeah, we're still on the flex hole. We're here. We we're just talking about your all of your motors idling at like 15,000 RPM. I, I <laughs> the question is, and this will be the last question of the night. I got to get going. Have you ever forgot to put an oil gallery plug before breaking in a motor? <laughs> Only need to learn that lesson once. We do, but the nice thing is that before breaking in the motor, we pre lube it. So we find those things. When we pre lube it and go, look, it only has like six pounds of oil pressure. What's going on? It will have more than that on the drill. Because we know, like, when we, when we do our oiling, our pre oiling on the LS, we know from cranking it over what we do on the LS, for instance, we'll, we use a drill on the conventional ones to spin the pump so we can find those things. But on an LS, what we do is we cap all of the ho the holes for the crankcase. And then we put two or three pounds of pressure in the crankcase to get the oil going up to the pump. And then we um, hit the starter button and it will spin the pump. So we're pre lubing the, you know, kind of pushing the oil into the pickup, into the pump. And then what it does is it catches immediately. And then we have about 40 pounds of pressure while we're spinning the motor over with no, we take, we have the plugs out obviously for that. And that works out very well. But if we only have 10 pounds or five pounds from doing that, then we go, oh wait, there's a problem. And there's a problem that we get to cure and not have a broken motor by trying to start it. Especially if you run into a situation like I talked about before, where you're cranking and cranking and cranking and the thing won't work. Because of whatever reason, you know, you don't have the ECU hooked up right. Maybe you don't have the, the um, you have the wrong cam sensor in the wrong crank sensor. You haven't crossed over. Whatever the deal is, it won't start. And it's not cooperating. And you're just keep laying in the starter trying to get the thing to start. And all you've done now is burn out all the bearings. <laughs> so you find these things by pre-lubing the motors. And a lot of times I'll even do that on the junkyard motor. So we'll we'll go through that procedure when we first start it. I just want to give the thing a fighting chance because <laughs> who knows how poorly it's been treated, you know, in its past life before we get it. And we know that we're going to do power things to it. So, but thank you guys all for showing up. Uh, I will see you guys all tomorrow and hopefully I'll be heading down to West Tech pretty soon.